The scripture reading today is John 12, 20 to 33. Now there are some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for the eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said, It had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice for your benefit, not mine. Now, it's, 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 now is the time for judgment on the world, on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Heavenly Father, blessed Jesus, and comforting Holy Spirit, we ask that you would be with us right now, and that we will understand these words we have just heard. We want to say that as we come to hear these words, uh, we are arising from the distractions of life that we has, have faced this, week's, this week and the challenges of life too. We pray, Lord, that you would help us focus on you right now as we hear these words. May your Holy Spirit touch our hearts. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus rides the donkey into Jerusalem. People celebrate the coming of this new young rabbi uh, into Jerusalem. They put their cloaks on the road and they wave palm branches. But behind this celebration, there is tension in the air. The religious leaders of Jerusalem are against Jesus. This is John chapter 12. In John chapter 11, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead miraculously. Since then, Jesus has become very popular. Crowds greet him even though he rides into Jerusalem, not in a Rolls Royce, but on a donkey. Of all animals, a donkey. And the religious leaders of Jerusalem, the chief priests and the Pharisees, now look for opportunities to arrest Jesus. And it is at this point, here in John chapter 12, something miraculous happens. Up until now, in the Gospel of John, which is the fourth book of the New Testament, Jesus has been uh, on a mission around northern, uh, the northern part of Israel called Galilee um, and in Jerusalem, in the Jerusalem area. He has not ventured outside Israel to non-Jewish territories where the people speak Greek. 
So Jesus, so now John tells us that some Greek speaking people come to see Jesus. Now, there were some Greeks among those who went up to, festi- to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So these are Greek speaking non Jews who have been converted into the Jewish, Jewish religion. And they are in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Some Bible scholars tell us that this is the turning point in the Gospel of John when it comes to Jesus' ministry. Um, the focus of, the, of his ministry so far has been in Galilee and around Jerusalem, and now there is a possibility of Greek-speaking people coming into the focus of his mission. So how does Jesus respond to this news of Greek-speaking non-Jews wanting to come to him? And let us read this now because it tells us a little bit about what is on Jesus' mind at this point. So let us read this verse together. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So Jesus acknowledges that he has reached this pivotal point in his ministry. It is not only people from Galilee and around Jerusalem who are coming to see him. It is the Greek speaking people outside Israel who are waiting, who are wanting to see Jesus too. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The Son of Man being a title that he uses of himself um, as, as he re- refers to himself in his discussions with people. The hour has come or the time has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. However, what is this pathway to glory for Jesus? Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So, unless a single seed falls down to the ground and dies, it will not become a plant producing many seeds. I believe that Jesus is referring to the seed of the cross here. Something that we're going to celebrate uh, in under two weeks' time. The cross on Good Friday. And unless he dies, he will not be glorified. He will not be able to produce many seeds. The pathway to glory for Jesus goes to the cross. I grew up in a city in Malaysia, and I do not know what it means to live in a farm to produce crop. Uh, I'm an urban animal, as some people would call me. There was a science experiment which I had to do uh, in lower secondary school that exposed me to what it means to grow a plant. Uh, We were all instructed to put a bean um, into a ball of cotton wool in the glass jar. And we then had to water the bean every day on the cotton wool. um, And to my surprise... For the first time in my life, I was actually growing something out of a seed, out of a bean. And that bean plant came out sprouting within three or four days. And over the years, as I have reflected over my old high school experiment, not that we all reflect over our old high school experiments when we grow up, I have thought of Jesus' words. Unless a grain of wheat falls down to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And unless the bean falls down to the ground, which is an act that symbolizing, symbolizes dying, dying, there can be no pl- new plant that produces many seeds. Without death, There is no life. That is what Jesus is seeming saying. And death is used figuratively. Death means things that we experiment, uh, experience in life that cause us great challenges, that help, uh, uh, 
sickness or relational difficulties, whatever struggles we have in our life, that kind of reminds us that we are not, in some ways, having the life that we ought to be experiencing. And then Jesus says that his followers have to go through the same thing too. They have to go through the cross, if you like, the struggles of life to experience glory in your life. So this is what uh, Jesus says, and let us read these two verses together right now. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Jim Caviezel, whose initials are JC, uh, was 33 when he played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ, the film that is directed by Mel Gibson. Caviezel has said that his faith is his guide, both personally and professionally, and that God called him to the acting profession. Before casting the actor to play Jesus, uh, Mel Gibson told this up-and-coming actor that the role might cost him his career. But Caviezel, a confessing Christian, wanted to honor his Lord by portraying his life and death. Caviezel responded to Gibson. We all have a cross to carry. I have to carry my own cross. If we don't carry our crosses, we are going to be crushed under the weight of it. As it turned out, Caviezel's decision to carry the cross of Christ has definitely cost him career opportunities. Following his role in the Passion of the Christ, Caviezel's credits have been anything but impressive. Caviezel said that he doesn't worry about the career price he has paid with that film, a global box office smash that led to fewer, not more, film offers for him. The awards, the Hall of Fame that actors get into here on earth, he said, don't matter to him. His reward, he said, will come in heaven. Caviezel said, Jesus is as controversial now as he has ever been. Not much has changed in 2,000 years. We have to give up our names, our reputations, and our lives to speak the truth. And of course, on March the 23rd, there is this new film that's coming out in the theaters called Paul, the Apostle of Christ. And Jim Caviezel is going to play Luke in that movie. Jesus tells his followers that they too must follow in his footsteps and die to their selfish lives before they can receive the eternal life promise. He then reflects over his future, and as he reflects about it, his soul becomes troubled, as John tells us. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there uh, and heard it said had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So this voice from heaven comes down to them just after Jesus says his soul is troubled and he is wondering if he has it to go to the cross. God speaks to the crowd. He is this voice from heaven. And God says, strangely enough, that he has glorified his name and will glorify it again. So God talks about two times in which his name will be glorified. So what does this mean? How has God glorified his name before? I believe that we move from 
uh, Jesus is moving, if you like, from glory number one to glory number two. And glory number one, I believe, was the moment when Jesus was born. And you hear the angels singing to the shepherds at Bethlehem, Glory to God in the highest. Peace now on earth to all people. And I believe that that is the first time that God glorifies his name. The glory of Christmas. And now God says he will glorify his name for the second time. And I believe it is through Jesus going to the cross and the resurrection. So there is meaning to this whole church calendar business. We move from Christmas in December to eat Good Friday and Easter Sunday sometime in the spring. The glory of Christmas leads to the glory of the cross and the resurrection. The glory of Christmas leads to the glory of Good Friday and Easter. So, everyone hears this voice from heaven. And Jesus makes a comment about it. And let us read Jesus' comment about this voice from heaven. Let us read it. Jesus said, This voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So from these words, we see that Jesus is talking about two results that will happen when he glorifies God's name for the second time. And the first one is something that we don't often talk about, especially in sermons these days. He says that the prince of this world will, will be driven out. And I believe he's referring to the evil one here, to the devil, to Satan. So somehow through this act of dying, uh, being the seed that falls down to the ground, Jesus becomes victorious over Satan. As we read about the events of Good Friday, there is something that's very prominent that comes out in the Gospels. We read that Satan enters the mind of Judas Iscariot and starts to influence him to betray Jesus. And I believe that it is the prince of this world, it is this evil one, it is this Satan who is be orchestrating things behind all these religious leaders as they plot to crucify Jesus. And at some moment, it looks pretty hopeless, doesn't it? As we read through the Good Friday passages. Jesus is arrested in the garden, and then he goes through a few trials, and then he goes to the cross. And each time, we see the power of all the human beings involved coming down upon him. And each way Jesus turns, it goes to the cross. And yet, and yet, the Bible tells us that in this time of defeat on the cross. It is not God who is defeated. It is the prince of this world. It is Satan who is defeated. So in Hebrews chapter 2, this is what it says. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And then there's the second consequences, consequence of Jesus going to the cross. The first is the prince of this world will be defeated. The second is 
And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So at this pivotal point in John chapter 12, the people of Galilee have come to Jesus, the people from northern Israel. We also read that the people of Jerusalem have come to Jesus. And now the Greek-speaking non-Jews from the lands outside Israel are coming to Jesus. It is now 2,000 years since Jesus spoke these words. And we are here today. You are here today. I am here today. And we are not the people of Galilee, nor the people of Jerusalem, nor the Greek-speaking non-Jews of the first century. And as I often say, We are a congregation of 50% of the people born in North America and 50% of the people born outside North America. This statistic itself is a miracle because we read today of uh, people becoming more focused in their culture, if you like, in their ethnic identity, which is all good because I believe God gave us culture. And yet, we see in our church family today a picture. A picture of uh, reconciliation among people. And it is all because of Jesus. Jesus continues to draw all people to himself. So, how did this happen? Remember the voice from heaven to the people. And God declares that he has glorified his name already and will glorify his name again. And the first time he glorified his name was through the glory of Christmas. And the second time he glorifies his name is through the glories of Good Friday and Easter Sunday. The glory of Christmas leads to the glory of Good Friday and Easter. Through Christmas, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, God glorifies his name and draws all people to himself. When the Bible scholar N.T. Wright or Tom Wright was asked what he would tell his children on his deathbed, he said, look at Jesus. And Tom Wright explained why. The person who walks out of the pages of the Gospels to meet us is just central and irreplaceable. He is always a surprise. We never have Jesus in our pockets. He is always coming at us from different angles. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but part of the drama that has him as the central character. Yesterday was, you guessed it, St. Patrick's Day. I forgot to wear green today. And uh, if you know a little bit about uh, the history of this 5th century uh, personality, uh, you will read about him and say that, and it says that he was captured and he was taken to Ireland as a slave. Uh, in those days, they had slavery. And then he escaped slavery. But when he went back to England, God worked on his heart and gave him a vision for the people who enslaved him in the past. This is just um, an incredible thought when you think of it, right? Uh, normally, when people enslave us in other figurative means, uh, we want to run out of the place. Whereas St. Patrick actually went back to Ireland and had a profound, profound impact um, on um, Ireland un- that even until today, which is like uh, 1,500 years later, St. Patrick is still a major personality for us to look at. And I'm going to close today with uh, what in some circles is known as the prayer 
of St. Patrick. Because uh, to follow up with this uh, verses that we have looked at, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. St. Patrick's words, pr- pr- prayer words here, talks about the centrality of God working in our lives and the focus of Christ in redeeming us and saving us. We will now end with this prayer of St. Patrick. As I arise today, may the strength of God pilot me, the power of God uphold me, the wisdom of God guide me, may the eye of God look before me, the ear of God hear me, the word of God speak for me, may the hand of God protect me, the way of God lie before me, the shield of God defend me, the host of God save me. May Christ shield me today. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit. Christ when I stand. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. And the people said, Amen.